All right. So I'd like to thank you all because you had a choice between having a lunch with friends and hearing someone with a strong French accent talking about design and verification. So thanks a lot for being here, being patient. And um, I will talk about these jobs, how it positioned into the industry. If it is a good job, I understand most of your students and perhaps thinking about what to do next, what to do for a living. Um, one important for, for, for a job for me is that it is a fun job and probably considering money also. So we will see what we do every day in doing verification. And I have prepared another live demo for the end of this talk. Uh, let's see if it happens better or not. So if you have any question, please raise your hand. We can see if we can take them live. Anyway, we'll have some space at the end for questions. So just to start with money. So this comes from IC Resource, which I understand is a sponsor also from your organization. And we can see the salary that is offered to graduate when they join an industry, a company. And you can see that after six years of experience, verification engineers have a bit more money here because the job is probably a bit more complex. Good news is also a bit more interesting. I will present myself. So I really have a passion for electronics. So it copes really, really well with your organization. If, if I were a student, I would love to, to join this organization. Let me show you first some projects that I do at home. That's not my work. That's really fun that I have at home. On the last side, you see a second version of the robot. The first version didn't don't go well. So this is a second version where I took part in the electronic you might see here with a team looking for mechanics. So this robot joined a competition 15 years ago, um, European uh, competition, and we reached uh, the eighth finalist uh, with this robot. The second picture is a simple PCB. I have put plenty of them in my home and it controls all the lights, all the curtains in my home. I put a CAN bus in my home so we can connect switches and lights and it's all remote controlled uh, also from internet. The picture on the right, and I can prove it's a real device here, I have it here. The device that I've made for a person that I met randomly on the internet who unfortunately is extremely disabled because he, it's, he suffers ALS. Uh, it's, um, it's a disease that breaks all the connection between brains and muscles, so he can't move at all. The only thing he can does is just contract some muscles, and when he does that, it, it just moves a bit the skin. And this device is here with some sensors to, to check the movement of the skin. And when he, na he has an emergency, he can contract his skin for three times with a defined patterns, and it rings a bell uh, to, to, to inform his wife uh, that he, he needs something. He has that device working and alive for two years now, I guess. And this device saves his life already twice. So he sent me a message already twice saying that something happened with his medical assistance um, and this device allows him to, to still be alive. So that's home fun at work. That's a product that I have delivered in my previous company. On the left is one of the one of the first processors I work on while I was working in ARM. It's an iPhone 4S, very successful, very successful phone. I learned a lot during that project. We made some of our project also for smart cards with some security involved, and also on the first Raspberry Pi, the model one, the processor that is inside here is something that we have made at the very beginning of, of my career. So in terms of job, that's the kind of product you can deliver. And believe me, when you are able to buy a device where you know you have worked on for real, it's, it's really motivating and, and a pleasant experience. Regarding the market, an electronic market and industry, what we have, 14 years ago is this BBC Micro um, 
has been sold perhaps once in every hundred household. Very, having a computer at home was exceptional. At the beginning of the century, let's say everyone has one Windows computer. I put a picture of Windows 95 here. You can find a computer in, in all houses. And today, inside a phone, you have 10 different processors in one phone. Because obviously there is a main processor in your phone, but there are several others, like in the Bluetooth controller, like in the touchscreen, like in some USB connections. So you have literally dozens of processors in a single phone today. And you have a lot of processors also in your house. So this is really a market that is really growing. And you might ask, is this market continue to grow? So let's see my opinion here. If you worked a long time ago on vacuum tube technology, on uh, cathodic ray TVs, you know, the big TVs that are that fat, they, they doesn't exist anymore at all. But if you were an engineer in this industry, you have to do something else in your life because being very good at calculating these devices is not useful anymore. If we look at the digital digital world as of today, virtually today, everything has a processor inside. Music player, camera, earbuds, and even doorbells, coffee machine, if you can program them, there is a microprocessor in it. USB cable, inside the USB cable, there is a little chip that uh, connects and controls the protocol. So you have even processor inside a cable. And so I think this, this technology might change one day, but very far. We are still at the beginning of the curve, according to me. But anyway, the skills you are learning at school and the skills to be an engineer will still be the same, even if the technology moves a bit. Let me share you why. The best skill set for an engineer is this one. Having the ability to solve problems that never existed before. For me, that's the skill you must learn during your studies and that you must learn the rest of your career. You will be faced with problems that does not exist yet and you have to solve them. Nobody has solved them before. That's your job. That's why you are an engineer. And you need some tools some knowledge to be able to make that, that uh, these solutions. I'll name a few, especially in the electronic design. Obviously, one of the major things you need to do is programming a computer. I am a lazy person, so I prefer when the computer works and not me. So my job is to program the computer so it can do a lot of things while I am thinking about something else. I love automation, so I use a lot of Python, C, C++ to make program and script to automate my work, so my work becomes more simpler. Obviously, computer science, how to use a Linux computer, how to use Git versioning control is something very important. You need to be aware a bit of electronic, logic, digital design with some part of the processor, how we, we, we construct an IC integrated circuits that's the thing you are you are being taught at school i love when um, people also have personal experience so having a screwdriver having fun with a 3d printing doing some soldering is some skills that are really useful because you learn a lot by you doing your personal project even if it is a project at school you can learn a lot with that that's extremely valuable experience How is the life now of a design or a verification engineer? Let's have a look on what is the job? Why are we working? What are we trying to produce? So in Codasip, we are producing processor. I will not teach you processor right now in, in uh, dozens of minutes. Let's take just, for example, a cache. So a cache is part of a memory that is here to accelerate transfer from the processor and to the external memory. This is from Wikipedia, a description of a pseudo-associative cache, and you can see some cache structure, 
how it works internally with some tag data blocks. So you might check how a cache is working. <clears throat> but what I am seeing today is the job of a design engineer is to take a specification like this one and make the design. And this is an example of design. So this is a very log implementation of some logic. So obviously the cache is much bigger than that. It's just to show you that this language and this hardware description language is this language which allows to make the full flow going to silicon. So this is really the source of what will go in silicon after. So you can see some equation with ifs, with names, and when here you are a real logical equation where when this condition happens, then you have the query valid that is taking some value. And we are assigning value. There is a clock, and each clock cycle, you get some calculation, the next value, and you you follow up with um, with the rest of the design process. What are the constraints? To make a design good, to make a good product. Of course, being a verification engineer, the first constraint for me is it must work. We are talking about quality. It must match the specification. That's the work of the verification engineer. The difference between the best design that will sell very well and um, a design that is that has less value is how much is cost to produce. The silicon area. If the design is very big, it will be very expensive to produce. Time to market. If you have the best design in 10 years, that's too late. What is the power consumption? Everyone wants a phone that lasts longer. So we are talking about the power consumption of all the design inside the phone. And the lower the power consumption, the better the battery life. We can talk about speed in uh, gigahertz and the performance faster phone is more interesting than a slower phone. So these are all the constraints that the verification, the design engineer must fit to have a good, very good product. On the other end, the verification have some other constraints. We must prove that the Verilog implementation fully matches the specification. And we have to prove to the customer that we have made all the possible effort to make it good quality. So what are the constraints? We must ensure that the design is functionally correct in all cases. Whatever the configuration, whatever the program that is running on your CPU, whatever the external environment, it must work. And we need to demonstrate that quality to the customer. So what is a good mindset to get quality. This is this is a joke that I, I love. A verification engineer walks into a bar and as a verification engineer he will make plenty of tests. Order a beer, zero beer, a lot of beers, a lizard, minus one, some random thing. And the first real customer walks into the bar and asks for where the bathroom is. Here that's an example of something that have not been tested and obviously when it is not tested there is a bug in it. Let's see a simple example. So we can put the verification skills into practice and to show you a bit more how we start to verify some IC design. Let's take a FIFO. So for, for, for FIFO stands for first in, first out. So this is a very old example of a FIFO, a drive-in in McDonald's, you enter the queue, and the first to enter the queue, exit the first, first in, first out. In IC, this is how it looks like. There is a clock, you put some data in, so you start to queue, right to FIFO, and you have some signals to say that the FIFO is full, is half full or is empty, and you have the data out. When you get your menu, you are exiting the queue from the McDonald's. So this is a design, that is quite simple to verify. Let's see how we verify this one. DUT stands for device under test. That's the thing we want to verify. To verify it, we put some things around. That's called the test bench. We have something that will push something inside the FIFO. 
we have something that will get the data out of the FIFO. We will monitor what enter, we will monitor what exit on this interface, and we have a scoreboard that compares that everything that has been pushed in will get out and in the same order. We have test cases, so this dictates an architecture what is sent, uh, which cars, which menu, and we make sure that it works. That's a basic test bench, and one part of your, the day life of a verification engineer is to code, that with programming language, to code this test bench. When this test bench is running and someone finds a bug, you see this screen. This screen is a waveform of what happens in all these signals. And you have, with the time, you have the different values that these signals are taking during the simulation. The goal with this screen in front of you, with the code of the test bench, with the code of the design, find where the bug is and fix it. That's the job of a verification engineer. From this simple example, let's see a real more complex example. So the FIFO is a very simple uh, example. Let's see how a CPU might work. This CPU is an example of a six stage pipeline and on each pipeline stage, you see a lot of boxes. I will not go into the detail, but you can see just from that diagram that it's a bit more complex. And we are just talking about the CPU and the internal of a CPU. If I put back in perspective from a real CPU in CODASIP, like the S71X, the diagram here is just this box here. Outside of the CPU, you have some other items, branch predictor, multiplier, memory management unit, some TCMs, some caches, some interrupt controller, and plenty of other things, which brings again more complexity. Another parameter you need to know is that the CPU itself, talking about the interfaces, doesn't really have an input like the FIFO, doesn't really have an output like the FIFO has. So you cannot really compare what's in, what's out. CPU is getting its own life where it starts, when you have a reset, it starts to fetch instruction from the memory. So instruction is a pack of bits like this. It executes it. It does an addition, a multiplication, a branch or something. And sometimes, or some operation, it writes the data back to the memory. Much difficult to verify than a FIFO. Verification is not simple, and that's why it's solved to find solution for this challenge. Brian Kernigan is a famous guy, quite old, with his friend Denis Ritchie, have written the famous book, The C Programming Language. And this is a picture of the first Hello World program that has been made in C. And Mr. Kernighan, I've made a, a quote that I really like to explain some principle to make successful products. This one. Debugging is twice as hard as writing the code in the first place. Therefore, if you write the code as cleverly as possible, you are by definition not smart enough to debug it. Perhaps that's why verification people are more paid than design engineers. But anyway, what you need to remember from that is keep your design simple. You will be much successful in having a product simple, which works, which is reliable, which is testable, because it has a better quality in the end. And that's what I learned when I made my two robots. The first one was extremely complex. I was a student, I want to put a camera, some laser guide, some uh, connection with the external world and beacons and anything. And I have a very complex robot that cannot follow a simple straight line. The second one was much simpler. And we scored much more with that. Keeping the design simple, you will have a better time to market, you will have a better quality and better verification in the end. So how do we 
how do we verify a processor and make it the best quality? Let's start with an example that might be simple, but it's not that simple. Let's just test the addition. Let's just take the operation A plus B. Now it is processor are 64 bits. So if I want to exhaustively test the addition, I want to test all the value for A and all the value for B. So we'll start with 0 plus 0, 0 plus 1, 0 plus 2, etc. In total, that's probably on some mathematical courses you have done, you have a lot of combination. 2 at the power of 64 multiplied by 2 at the power of 64. That's a lot of tests. If you can run this test at 1 gigahertz, that will be a lot of years, much more long than the age of the Earth. So a poor verification engineer might become like this guy waiting for the test to finish. But we have some solutions. We have, and that's the beauty of the job, is how we can make smart solutions so we can verify the processor with good quality and not die waiting a test to finish. So before I give you the solution, let me share with you what Codasip is doing, what solution we propose to the market inside Codasip. Designing processor is hard, expensive, and take years. But does it have to? No. So in Codasip, we have crafted tools to make design of processor and verification simpler than the other propositions that exist on the market currently. We have two ranges of products. One is processors. We are developing RISC-5 processors, 32 bits, 64 bits, for application processors, which are fast, for embedded application, which are lower, lower consumption, they are all RIS-5 compliant. RIS-5 is a novel architecture which is open source. So the documentation is accessible and uh, we can compare with that documentation and make sure it complies. And it's configurable. So that's one side of Codasip. The other side of Codasip is making the tool to develop the processor faster because we do the higher level description. I think you would agree that writing a program in Python is much faster and easier than if you write it in assembly code. So we have similar technology to design the processor, not using Verilog and the example with the equation you have seen before, but using a higher level language where you can write your processor faster. With the higher level of abstraction, it is simpler and we can verify them simpler. When we combine these two tools, we are able to propose to the market some Codacip cores with a possibility to modify them. Modifying them by the customer can bring them the possibility to add a new instruction. And this new instruction specific to the customer can improve by a factor of 10 or up to 100 a given algorithm that is done in software. If we move from the software implementation to a real hardware instruction, you can have very fast, very fast execution. So that's what we propose to the market today. We have a range of processors. Uh, I will skip this slide. And I will skip this slide also. OK, regarding the principle of verification, find all the bugs, find them fast, so we can release product soon, and obviously control the cost. Let me show you two methodologies. In the good verification methodology, you have small holes. Ah, hopefully you have none. And in a bad verification methodology, in a poor verification methodology, you have big holes. And if you have big holes in your verification methodology, bugs are going through and are eating the final product. But even if the good verification have some hole, how we can guarantee we have a lot of very successful and strong reliable product? It's simple. Just put all these slices together to make sure that if some slice have some hole, any bugs that the designer have put in its code, they are going through the slices. And in the end, in the final deliverable, one of the slice 
one of the slices will catch the bug and we will fix it. Of course, like real life, it's Friday, it's Friday afternoon, and you put some bigger holes here. So the goal of this methodology, not only to find the bug before the product gets into delivery, but all these methodologies we use in verification are improving each other. Because if we find, for example, in this case, this bug managed to go through and we find it when running some OS on FPGA. If we find this bug at this slice, it means that the previous slice have an hole inside them. So our job is to make sure we identify this all and fix them. So we can remove that all here, remove that all here, remove that all here. So on top of improving the quality of the deliverable, we are improving our verification methodology overall. But there is one more skill you need to have. Being a white hat hacker, trying to break the design, trying to break the design and not Ensure that it works. That's the reverse methodology. Make sure you can break it. Let's take a real example here. And I think I will, I will, I will do the live demo. So let's say we want to verify a device like a chain. So you are pulling it, checking it, etc. And what you are looking for is a weak link where the bug might be. So I have printed yesterday some, some device like this one. Let's say it's a chain and the specification says that the blue part and the yellow part cannot be pulled apart. They are tied together. So if I, if I pull it, if I shake it, if I squeeze it, twist it or whatever, I can say that, okay, these parts are tied together and I cannot separate them. And you can do it a lot. And if you do this way, you will never find a bug. If you look a bit more in the design, you will conclude that obviously there is an obvious way to separate them, but you need to make a good pass. So as a verification engineer, you can be proud to have found a bug and you give that design to the designer in order to make a fix. So let's do the live demo. The designer is working hard and is bringing that fix. Let me apply the fix to his design. So I brought some glue, that re real patch, so that real glue, try to not stick my finger on it, some glue, and I am fixing the design this way. And you can say, just looking at this right now, you can say, okay, probably the design is fixed. I'll wait a couple of more seconds because the designer have analyzed the bug. He discovered that the blue part goes away from that side and now it's fixed. Okay. A poor verification engineer will conclude, okay, it's not breaking. You cannot separate them. All right. And you can pull it, shake it, twist it. It's even more difficult to find the bug now. And if you are a better verification engineer, you can just make some tests and discover that, hey, there is still a bug in this design. So you go back to the verification engineer and say, okay, find a better way to fix it. That's where you need some um, good team work. Make sure that you work together in a way that, okay, when you do a patch like this, even if you think it will work, make sure your design is sufficiently simple so that there is no convoluted pattern here and there is no way for the bug to exist. If you manage to design in a way that there is no bug, you can you 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 have a very strong design in the end. So I'm glad that this demo worked. In terms of team, we are a European company. These are all the headquarters and design center we have currently in the company. The biggest one is in Czech Republic. Czech Republic currently employs a bit more than 100 persons. I am in France here. It's a very nice place. We are 10 people. We have a design center in Spain, 
in UK, two design centers in UK, near Cambridge and in Bristol, in Germany. Recently, since less than three months, we have a design center growing in Greece and some offices for sales and support in US and in Asia. Let me show you one team, the French team. So this is us. Um, you might say that we are not 10 people yet because this picture was taken last winter. You can see it's winter because some people have long leaves. It's winter here on the Côte d'Azur, but still the screen, the screen, the sky is blue. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you do, I will be very glad if you can take this link on LinkedIn and make sure you follow Codasip. That will be your way to say to me that the, the presentation was interesting. And there's a, a pool right now in LinkedIn to vote for the best design center. So feel free to take part in it and vote for your best design center. Thank you very much.